tu veux. Alors, c'est avec plaisir que je vous présente aujourd'hui Philippe Saint-Jean. Philippe a fait son baccalauréat à l'Université de Montréal. Il l'a terminé en 2009. Je lui ai d'ailleurs enseigné en 2009 le cours d'optique quantique. Et j'ai vérifié dans la même même classe, il y avait Gabriel Antonius, qui est aussi professeur à l'UQTR. Moi, c'était un bon prix, là, deux professeurs dans la, la même classe. Et euh, par la suite, il est allé faire un, son doctorat à Polytechnique Montréal, qui est le doctorat qu'il a terminé en 2016 sous la direction de Sébastien Franca. Et euh, muni d'une bourse postdoctorale du CSNG, il est allé euh, travailler au Centre des nanosciences et nanotechnologies de l'Université Paris-Saclay, dans le groupe de Jacqueline Bloch. Um, donc, j'ai diminué d'une bourse à SNG, mais éventuellement, il a aussi obtenu une bourse Marie Curie. Um, et euh, il, est, il est resté là de 2016 à 2020, en s'intéressant essentiellement au euh, polariton topologique, c'est le sujet dont nous allons de toute évidence. Euh, en 2020, il est de retour à Montréal. Où il a fait un court séjour chez euh, Indian Systems avant euh, de, de prendre le 1er juillet un poste de professeur adjoint au département de physique de l'Université de Montréal dans le cadre d'une chaire de recherche en photonique quantique euh, financée par le ministère de l'Économie et de l'Innovation. Euh, avant de... de je vais laisser euh, faire son signal. Je vais m'entendre, c'est pas grave. Je suis sûr qu'il va parler très vite pour que ça termine euh, dans le temps. Je mentionnerai qu'il a écrit un article de perspective sur les polaritons. Donc, je suis sûr que le sujet intéresse. Il a écrit un article de perspective euh, sur les polaritons topologiques avec Alberto Hamot. Et euh, ça, ça paraîtra sous peu dans le Journal of Physics euh, Photonics. Donc, euh, Philippe. Donc, merci beaucoup pour euh, l'introduction, Richard. Ça me fait vraiment plaisir d'être ici. Euh, maintenant, pour les, euh, bah, pour les besoins de la, de la présentation, je vais, je, vais, je vais parler en anglais. So, uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. So, the title of my talk today will be about topological physics with light and matter. And I will try to discuss what are the new horizons that we're looking into right now. And we're usually used to studying topological physics in condensed matter. We're usually used to study this kind of physics in, in system of electronics moving solid state crystal. But my aim today is to show how we can extend this physics to systems that are not necessarily based in condensed matter, but are made of hybrid particles made out of light and matter. All right. So uh, just briefly summarizing what I'll be discussing today. So I'll first start by doing an introduction to what we call topological polaritonics. And doing this, I'll show how we can also talk about topological photonics which are the counterpart of topological physics of matter in photonics or polarotonic systems. Then I will discuss two recent examples of, of uh, experimental work that we had that I have done uh, during my postdoc in the group of Jacques and Bloch, one measuring topological invariance in polarotonic analogs of graphene, and the other one is the observation of novel kind of nonlinear excitation that is the topological detector. And finally, if, if time allows, I'll briefly discuss what is my, my aim in the upcoming years uh, in studying topological physics in system uh, involving quantum optics. All right. So before becoming a transdependence matter, topology is a branch of mathematics that is interested in global properties, global geometric properties. So in order to, to mention what, what we mean by a global properties, let me put it in contrast with a local property. So let's say that we have an object. We can define, for instance, its curvature. This curvature is defined locally. We can define point by point around this object. And as a result, this quantity is really sensitive to any deformation. If we have a sphere and we start to squeeze it, the curvature, the field of quadrature will change from point to point. In comparison, it is possible to define global properties that are defined throughout the entire objects, like the volume of the area, but we can define also global properties that are more robust to perturbation, and we call them topological properties. And one really well-known example is called a genus number. It was introduced by Gauss a long time ago, and it is defined here by the integral over an entire surface of this curvature. And what is remarkable is that although the integrand, the curvature, is a property that can change smoothly when we deform the object, the 
integral does not change. It always gives rise to an integer number. And this integer number will always stay the same unless we poke a hole into the surface or close a hole. And so this genus number is often what we call a topological invariance. And what was recognized in the early 1980s is that in fact, this topological physics can be extended to the solid states where we now define the these topological invariants, not in real space, but in the reciprocal space. <laughs> Uh, is that better like this? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll be. I'll try not to move too much. So. <laughs> uh, yes. So, so as I was saying, we can define these invariants in reciprocal space. So, if we have a solid state first of all, we have periodicity, and, and we we have momentum, a momentum space over which we can define these invariants. So, I'm giving an example on top here, which is an integral over the entire Brillouin of a quantity k of k. So it is, it, is not, it is some type of curvature that we call a Berry curvature that's defined by, 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 this, by this observable here. And what is extremely nice is that this, this quantity here, also this Berry curvature can be deformed if we start to move the atoms inside the crystal, the integral with the entire Brillouin zone is completely invariant. It will always give rise to an integer number. And the only way to change this number is by closing the energy gap and reopening. And so one really nice example to envision this, a really clear example, is given by uh, what we call the topological insulators. So if we have a normal insulator in the zinc link structure, usually the conduction band is given, um, we have a, a conduction band and a, and a balance band are separated around the Fermi energy. And if we look at the eigenfunctions, often the, uh, the conduction band will be given by various states that belong to s type orbital, Whereas the balance band is formed by um, uh, eigenfunctions that are formed by p-type orbitals. Now, if we start to introduce the spin orbit interaction in these systems, we can change this band structure, eventually close the gap. And if the spin orbit is strong enough, reopen it. And it, as a result, the band structure can be completely identical if we look at the eigen energies, but be completely different if we look at the symmetry of the eigenfunctions. So indeed, here what we see on the right is that we move from uh, uh, from Vanier states that are S-type orbitals to P-type at the center of the Brillouin type of the Brillouin zone, and eventually S-type. And so this winding of the symmetry properties of the eigenfunction can be related to these invariants. And whereas the first one will be given by a C equals zero, so an invariant equals zero, that is trivial. The other one can give rise to plus and minus one. And so if we put in contact two of these materials that are topologically distinct, what we're going to see is that there will be the emergence of interface states that are robust against perturbation. And the nature of these states is that, as I said, if we want to change the value of, of this invariant, we need to close an energy gap. So as a result, we're going to have at the interface energy states at the energy of the gap and that don't have any counterpart in the bolt on each side. So as a result, if we have an electron moving in these states, it cannot scatter in the bulk on either side because there are no states that exist on both sides. And so as a result, we say that these states are topologically protected. And the point that we want to make is we want to study these, these robust edge states. This is the, the, the aim of, of this field. We want to study what is going on in, at, the, in, at the interfaces, and we want to, to take profit of this robustness. And it was, it was recognized in the around 2005 that in fact, this physics, as I said in my introduction, is not restricted to, uh, to condensed matter. So the first realization of this topological insulator was realized in mercury, tellurium, quantum well, so big atoms giving rise to a strong spin orbit interaction. And people have indeed observed that we have these unidirectional robust edge states at the surface of the material. But we can do the equivalent in the photonic system because photons, just like electronic waves, uh, can do scattering, they can do block scattering. And provided that we that we engineer an environment to this structure, to these to, to so a variation of a periodic variation of the index of refraction, we can emulate the movement of, of electrons in, in a in a crystals by using photons moving in a periodic variation of the index of refraction. So here I'm giving a very nice example that was demonstrated a couple of years ago in the group of uh, Mohammed Afisi at GQI, 
where we have, in fact, an array of couple ring resonators. So these are micrometer sized ring resonators that can't find photons, just like a whispering gallery mode, uh, whispering gallery uh, cavity. And, and the, these, these cavities are connected, um, so they're detected on the right here. So each of these, of, these, of these ring resonators is in blue, and they're connected by red um, connectors. And these connectors are a bit asymmetric. And as a result, when photons pop from one to the other, they do not pick up the same phase when they go to the right than they, when they go to the left. And this gives rise to an analogous spin orbit interaction. And these systems can emulate, uh, in fact, a spin quantum Hall effect, or what we call also a topological insulator. And we indeed see that at the interface, at the border of this, of this photonic crystal, there is the, emer the emergence of a chiral unidirectional photonic edge state. So this has uh, given rise to a field of topological photonics. And I, I would say that, uh, I would argue that the, the main objective of this field is to, is to explore topological physics beyond what can be achieved with electronic systems and condensed matter. And in order to, to explain what I mean by going beyond this, uh, I have separated this in three main objectives. The first one is that, well, these photonic systems, uh, we can build them in the clean room. So we have a lot of versatility. We have a lot of control over how we build our lattices. So this can allow us to, to, uh, to build some exotic phase that are not possible to reproduce or to synthesize in real crystals. So I'll give an example of such a system uh, later on in, in my talk. Also, photons are bosons, contrary to electrons. And so they have a distinct physics uh, that, we can, that we can explore. So we can see, are there any links to this quantum statistics um, on the topological physics, but also photons are intrinsically dissipative. And so they, they are an open system, they can be pumped, they are dissipative. So we, we have a non-hermitian system and the confluence of non-hermicity in, in topological physics can also give rise to interesting example, to interesting effects. I will have a, a, in the third part of my talk, an example that is directly related to this, this, uh, this idea. And finally, uh, we need to say that, in fact, photons are also extremely relevant at the technological point of view. And, and as a result, the building systems that are topologically protected could allow us envisioning new uh, potential generation of optical devices that are more robust to fabrication defects or environmental uh, fluctuation. And in this sense, there has been over the last few years, uh, a lot of demonstration of lasers that are topologically protected. The first demonstration uh, was realized in, in our group, but uh, now these, uh, these, these topological lasers have been demonstrated in more complex and more useful system, and they're becoming um, more, more and more um, close to real applications. And so what I would like to discuss throughout my talk is a system that is not purely photonic or purely electronics, but is made by a strong coupling between electronic excitation in photonic excitation, what we call a polariton. And so to explain how we build these, these quasi-particles, uh, we really have uh, here what is the cornerstone of, of our system. It, it is a two-dimensional planar cavity that is grown by epitaxy. So it's, it's, a, it's a succession of uh, semiconductor layers, three, five semiconductors, gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide, in which we encamp, uh, at the center of which we have a spacer, so an optical cavity, in which we can insert different quantum wells. Okay. And so inside these quantum wells, we, the uh, fundamental electronic excitations are called excitons. They have a dipolar moment and they can interact with light. And if this interaction to so the Rabi frequency between electron, uh, these excitons and the photons is stronger than the life, is, 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 is faster than the lifetime of the, of the photons inside the cavity, it means that the photon will be reabsorbed and remitted many times before it leaves the cavity. And in, this is what we call a regime of strong coupling. And in this regime, the eigenstates are no more photons or excitons, but they are called polaritons and they are formed by a linear combination of a photonic fraction and an excitonic fraction. And the advantage of using this hybrid particle comes from both of these components. From the photonic part, well, since photons are big objects, we can confine them in artificially built systems. So I will show how we can etch these two dimensional cavities to form artificial arrays that confine these polaritons. Eventually, these photons will leak out and we can collect these photons. And by collecting these photons, we have access to all the, uh, the characteristics of the polaritons, like their energy, their in-plane momentum, 
their face so we can reconstruct all the information we have about these collaborators. So it, it's a really convenient system at experimental, uh, the, the experimental point of view. And it's also necessarily an, an intrinsically open system because it's really dissipative. So we can use, harness this drive, the effect of drive and dissipation to, to create new effect. On the other side, the excitonic fraction gives rise to strong interparticle interaction because photons don't see each other, but excitons do see each other through the uh, Coulombic interaction. So this gives rise to really strong nonlinearity. And I will show in the third part of my uh, talk how we can harness this really strong nonlinearity to create new types of excitations. They're also sensitive to the magnetic field, which photons are not, which is really interesting if you want to implement new effects that rely on breaking time reversal symmetry. And they also give rise to a, a gain medium. It will provide a gain medium that we can use for triggering lasing or other kinds of application related to, to, to that. And so, as I said, we can use this as our, our backbone in order we can etch these, these cavities to form artificial materials. And we usually rely on approach by, based by on the tight binding approximation. Uh, summation. Well, the building block, so each atom is described by these uh, micro pillars. So these are about uh, several tens of microns on height, several microns in diameter. And we obtain them by etching uh, the planar cavity that I was showing earlier. And so as a result, photons are confined vertically by the Bragg mirrors and laterally by the variation of index of refraction. And so we have a, a photons that are confined in all three dimensions. And as a result, the eigenstates here are discrete energy levels that emulate somehow the atomic orbital. So we have a ground state that is symmetric, is in the sense of an S orbital. We have a first excited state that is doubly generated and it's asymmetric, reminiscence of P-type orbitals. So these can be viewed somehow as atomic, uh, uh, photonic at, uh, atoms. And eventually what we can do is to couple several of these micro pillars together by etching them closer than their diameter. And as a result, because the wave function of each micro pillar will overlap, their wave function will hybridize and they're going to form molecular orbits. And so what I'm showing here on the right, so we have, the case for a single atom and when we couple them together we see that they hybridize and so for example the ground set will form a bonding mode that is symmetric and an anti-bonding mode that is anti-symmetric and all the, the orbitals we couple to each other so what we can do eventually is couple more and more of these of these pillars and form uh, artificial materials so on the left here we have a system consisting of a basin like molecule so an hexagonal shape of distinct micro pillars and we see that we have a set of discrete eigenstates that are reminiscent of the Bayesian uh, electronic states. We have also one dimensional lattices that we can build where we start to have not discrete energy states, but we have bands as a function of a momentum. And eventually we can also build two dimensional lattice. So what I'm showing here is a honeycomb lattice that emulates the physics of graphene. So this is our playground for studying topological physics. This is how we use uh, our semiconductor uh, micro cavities to emulate different uh, type of material. And the idea is to use this platform to emulate the political phases of matter. So uh, as Richard was saying, was, was saying we, we wrote recently two different review articles. And one is already published in Optical Material Express and the other one that's uh, bound to appear very soon that review this field of topological polytonics. So I would like to give the first example, uh, the first example of a recent experiment that we have done, which is uh, if you recall, I was talking that we can define in our energy bands the topological invariant. And what I would like to show is an experiment that extracted directly from the bolt this invariant. And we did this in a an, uh, polytonic analog of graphene. So the idea is that often we, we, um, we explore topological material by probing the emergence of edge case or not. But as we have seen that topological properties are defined in the bulk, they're defined in the band structure. And one should have access to this information without relying on a measurement that is done at the interface, at an interface. And so there have been several examples of these types of measurement using interferometry measurement in cold atom systems, uh, using also what we call anomalous displacement. You launch a wave packet in, in your system and you look at how it evolves. And from, its, from the, the movement of a center of mass, you can extract some information on the band structures, or also a very curvature measurement localized in space uh, that are done to interferometry measurements also in, in, in cold atoms. But here, the I would like to show how we can extract the pol these topological invariants in graphene. And there is something very peculiar in graphene, 
the, how we define the invariance that makes it a little bit more tricky. And so I will go through, my aim here is to go through this experiment to show how we can define these invariance in group B, how we can measure them and what, what it gives. So before getting started, uh, we need to discuss about a really simple term model, uh, the really simplest case of a topological lattice, which is called the sushri for heger model. And you will see how it's so important in graphene. But at the beginning, uh, this, this model was developed to describe the physics of the polyacetylene molecule. So, um, but all you really need to know about this, this model is that it captures the physics of a bipartite lattice where all the atoms are identical, but the hopping energies are staggered from strong weak, strong weak, strong weak. And so therefore we can define two types of different dimerization depending on how we define the unit cell. Either we define it as um, a pair of atoms that are strongly connected together, which is called the mirrorization, which I call the dimerization one, or we define it with a weak link, which I call dimerization two. Obviously, these two definitions are completely equivalent when we have an infinite lattice. It is just the choice of, of unit cell. And as a result, the band structure is completely identical. You see, you have two completely identical band structure formed by two bands because we have two atoms per unit cell. However, they are not uniquely defined when we have semi-infinite semi -infinite, uh, or finite lattice because the unit cell needs to be commensurate with the end of the lattice. So the unit cell would be defined by how you end your lattice. And for these two dimerization, in fact, what you see is that if you look at the wave function, it is really different um, in, 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 both, in both cases. So if you look at, at, at the, how the phase evolved within a unit cell, we see that in the first case, so the, the, the lowest band here is always formed by bonding state. So state where the two atoms of the, of, of the dimer evolve in phase, where the upper band is formed by two atoms that are evolving out of phase. And throughout the brain wave zone, we always have this um, uh, inversion symmetry on the, on the lowest band and in the upper band. But in the other case, because the unit cell is not defined at, with a dimer, we have the opposite. At the center of the brain wave zone, yes, the unit cell atoms are still moving in phase, but as we move across and we reach the edges of the brain wave zone, now the atoms are evolving out of phase. And it is the opposite when we go to the upper band, where at the center of the brain wave zone, we're asymmetric wave functions within the unit cell, and at the edges, we're symmetric. So you see, again, we have this winding of the symmetry properties that I was describing earlier, and we can relate this to the topological invariant. And if indeed, if we calculate the, uh, the integral of the Berry curvature over the entire Brillouin zone, we see that in the first case, we have a value of zero, and the other case, we have a value of one. And in the latter case, we are expecting the emergence at the edges of the lattice of an edge state, a state localized at the center of the gap, which is our topolog topologically protected edge state. Yes. So in your drawing, yes, uh, the, you have a little bond in between the dimerization two. This, and this little bond is that the dimer system, or oh, this is the unit cell atom that you're representing? Uh, you mean in, uh, on the band structure? Yes. It, it's it, it, yeah. May, maybe it's misleading, but what I'm showing is a unit cell always. It's not a dimer. But in the band structure itself, it, it's, it's always the uh, the unit cell. Always the unit cell. Maybe I should have put a, a thin red line between yeah. the atoms. Yes, sorry. So you're saying that the lowest energy state is the one where the two atoms which are furthest are in, uh, in phase? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And we can see this because in the lowest band, the dimers are always evolving in phase. But if we define the unit cell, not within a dimer, but with neighboring dimers, because we are at the edge of the, the brain waves zone and, and, and dimers, neighboring dimers are evolving out of phase, necessarily we have at the edges that the two atoms are evolving out of phase. So maybe we can go back to this. So what we did here is to build this lattice uh, using our micro pillars. So we have a, a chain of couple of micro pillars that are close, far, close, far, close, far to each other. And what we see now when we do a non resonant photoluminescence experiments. So we shine a laser that is off resonant. So it, on the top of the micro pillars, it generates carriers inside the semiconductors. These carriers will thermalize and they will start to populate our, our polaritonic bands. And eventually 
photons will leak outside of the cavity and we're going to collect them as a function and of the angle at which they come out, which we can relate to the in-plane momentum. And this allows us to reconstruct, in fact, the band structure. So here the color shows the intensity. So dark is a high intensity and light is a low intensity. And we see that we have, as a function of momentum of energy, we have two energy bands separated by an energy gap here. This is exactly what we were expecting for, for this for these lattice. And now in order to extract the topological invariance, we relied on a technique that was developed by our collaborators at the ICFO in, in Barcelona, uh, Pietro Massignan and Alexandre Dauphin. And their, their scheme is, is based on a, a localized and non resonant excitation. So we create locally a wave packet, an incoherent wave packet, on one of the atom or one of the micropillars in our case. And we look at how this wave packet would evolve. It will spread throughout the lattice. It will form a pattern of intensity that we can collect. And then by assigning a different um, index value that we call a Carroll displacement operator to each micropillar, which is the product of the index of the unit cell. So zero, one, two, and on the left, minus one, minus two. And a sublattice index, which is plus one for A sublattice and minus one for B sublattices. We can compute what we call a mean Carroll displacement, which is just a scalar product between this vector of C values and the intensity over each of these atoms. And if we do this, this, uh, this uh, scalar product, we obtain a value called the mean Carroll displacement. And what these collaborators have shown is that in the thermodynamic limits, this value uh, tends toward the topological invariant. So this is what we have done. So we have launched a localized wave packet. We see how it spread. So this is the intensity as a function of real space and as a function of energy. So the middle graph here just shows an integration over all energies as a function of space. So we have the uh, intensity profile. And what we want to do is to do a scalar product between this curve and the value of C, which is either defined to a unit cell defined with a dimer or out of, uh, out of phase with a dimer. And we see that in the former case, so these two definitions are the red and blue curve. In the first case, we have a value very close to zero. In the other case, we have a value very close to one, which is what we expect. So this is the way to extract these topological invariants. And now the idea, as I said, is to, to do, use this technique to extract topological invariants in graphene. So the idea is that there is a very strong link between this really simple SSH model and the physics of graphene. And one really nice way to see it is that if you take graphene sheen like this one with the zigzag edge on top, a burden edge at the bottom and an armchair edge on the left, and now you start to compress it horizontally, you see that all the atoms are going to fall on distinct link lines that are close, far, close, far, close, far to each other. So you see that there is already a similarity with this in this uh, SSH model, but to really capture the entire fit, we need to look at the Hamiltonian. So if we define the unit cell um, that is commensurate with the zigzag edge, we can write the Hamiltonian like I did on top here. So you see that you have zero, we have a two by two Hamiltonian because we have two atoms per unit cell. You have a zero on the diagonal because we, we assume that we, we, we define the zero energy as the onsite energy. And the off-diagonal terms with our decoupling between the different atoms, you have a real term that describes the hopping within the unit cell. And we have two block term describing the hopping along the two different um, unit cell vector. But we can rewrite this Hamiltonian here as I'm doing here at the bottom. And we see that we now have capital J, which is a real value that depends, that de that de that de depends on Kx, plus J primes, which is also a, a uh, a real value that depends on kx multiplied by a block term. So we see that this latter version of how we write the Hamiltonians is isomorphic to the SSH Hamiltonian because we have a real intercell coupling and, and complex here term that is represents the uh, intercell coupling. And so what it says is that for every value of kx, the Hamiltonian is identical to that of the uh, uh, of the uh, SSH model. So for each value of Kx, we can see it as a different SSH model. And whether or not it is tri topologically trivial or not depends on the ratio between J prime and J. And you see that this will change throughout the Brillouin zone because J depends uh, on Kx as a function, uh, as a cosine. So we'll see that eventually J prime will be bigger than J 
smaller than j. And so if we do this, we can calculate a winding number for every cut in the, in the reciprocal space, vertical cut. And we see that depending on where we are, we're going to have regions where this invariant can be one, regions where it's zero, regions where it's one in blue, zero and, and white. And each time we change from one to the other is a, is a place where we cross a direct cone. And this is normal because this is a place where we close the energy gap and we reopen it. And we can do the same thing if we define our unit cell with a burden edge, which is just shifting the unit cell by half, in fact, the unit cell. And we say that we have the complementary here. We just change the definition of the J prime and J. All right. And so these edges have been observed experimentally in photonic systems. So we see that depending on where we are in the Briouison, so this is what I'm showing at the bottom right here, depending on where we are, we can see that we have an energy state that appear and it completely disappear at other position in the Briouison. It will be the complementary if we had the zigzag edge. All right. But now what we want to do is not to probe the edges, but really probe the ball. But for this, we need to filter different momentum in Kx and access the real space along y to calculate the mean chiral displacement. So you might find this surprising because we cannot access real and reciprocal space at the same time, but it's possible here because Kx and y are perpendicular. And the way we do this, and this is um, the novelty really of this work is this technique here, is that when we are going to uh, measure our photon, so this is the sample on the left, Usually, in order to measure as a function of the, the momentum, we have a first lens that is at the Fourier distance of the sample, a second lens at the Fourier distance of a spectrometer where the slit allows selecting a, a very um, precise uh, position. So without anything in the middle, we have real space uh, imaging. But if we put a lens at the, uh, at the Fourier distance of the Fourier plane, then we can measure um, this uh, angle dependent that I was showing for you. And the idea is now is that we don't use a spherical lens, but we use a cylindrical lens, such that the curvature is only along one direction. Here it will be Kx, because this is the, the momentum that we want to filter out. Whereas along y, the, the lens will not do any effect and we will have access to the real space. And if we do this, this is what I'm showing here. It's an example where the, the slit of the spectrometer is positioned such that it selects Kx equals zero component. And we have access to a real space along y. Uh, at the, um, this is the horizontal axis as a function of energy. And you see that you have something that is extremely similar to the SSH model. You have two bands. The bottom one is a bonding band, symmetric band. The upper one is an anti-symmetric band. And with this, we can compute simil in the same way the mean Carroll displacement. And we obtain a value of 0.12 and 0.84, one close to zero, one closer to one. We don't exactly get zero or one. I'll get to this point just right before. It. But what I want to say is not now we can shift the position of this of, of this, uh, this cylindrical lens and span across the entire reciprocal space. And what we see here is that depending on the definition of the unit cell, we're going to move from a value of one to zero to one to zero to one. And we change each time we cross a direct count, which are indicated by the uh, dotted lines here. And as I mentioned here, there are two things that are not like the theory is that we don't reach exactly one or zero and that we don't have abrupt changes. And this comes from the fact that in fact, our two dimensional lattice have a weaker uh, quality factor than our 1D lattice. It's more difficult to build. We have um, non-radiative recombinations. So the lifetime of photon is smaller and we don't have enough time to reach a, a thermodynamic equilibrium. So the, the argument that the mean Carroll displacement tends toward the, the exact winding numbering is not, is not a completely good argument. And we can reproduce this. In fact, this, the, the, the solid line are just a calculation using our uh, measured poly factor. We see that, that we can reproduce. But this is really the limiting factor. that. But we can still probe these, these phase transition. And finally, what we can do is explore a system that does not really excite, uh, exist in, in solid state and condensed matter. It is a system where we are going to apply strain to graphene. So we know that if we start to stretch graphene along an axis parallel to the armchair edge, we break the rotational symmetry and we're going to move direct on the side of the, the reciprocal space. And if we, the strain is strong enough, we can reach a critical regime where in fact the two direct cones are going to merge together. And we now have a system that is completely gapped throughout the entire reciprocal space. 
this is a system that is not possible to achieve in condensed matter because it requires too much strain, which would which is beyond what is what were the, the bonding energy of carbon atoms. But we can do this here because we can position our micropillis as we wish. So this is the lattice that you can see here. It is the honeycomb lattice that has been stretched. So this is why it looks a bit odd. And now if we measure these invariants, we see that we always always have one or zero. There is no modification because we never cross the direct line. There is never a topological phase transition. So using these techniques, there are many different perspectives. Uh, we could explore all the types of direct uh, systems. We have demonstrated recently different types of tilted direct cones, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the strain and the orientation of strain that we induce in our lattices. And we can use this technique to measure the, the, the topological properties of these unconventional systems. They're all here, everything has been done with the coupling of the ground state of each pillar. But we also have access to another sets of bands formed by p-type orbitals where the physics is really complicated really much more complex it's really rich but we also have direct ones. we have more direct ones uh, they are topological properties and we can start to uh, explore also this physics that also does not exist in a real uh, graphene uh, also there are other chiral system a system that share this chiral symmetry that could be explored uh, a very recent example that is interesting is what we call higher topology higher order topological invariants. These are systems, uh, if I make a short story, that uh, where the edge states are two units of dimensionally smaller than the system. So if we have 2D sheet, it means that the edge states are 0D. So they are corner states. And these are interesting because uh, they have uh, what we call higher order topological invariants. We could start to try to extract these, these types of invariants. But there are also systems with strong nonlinearity drive and dissipation that have a very complex physics that we could explore with this tool for probing the properties directly from the from the pool. All right. So now this brings me and, and this last aspect about nonlinearities and dissipation brings me to my um, second example that I would like to discuss is that in fact our polaritons are indeed nonlinear because they have this excitonic components that interact with each other and they're also dissipative. And can we harness this nonlinearity and this drive and dissipation to create new types of, uh, of states in, the, in, these, in, this, in these systems? So here I'm, I'm presenting what we call the gross pitayevsky equation, which is, in fact, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation where we're having included drive and dissipation. So we have the evolution of the wave function. This, the index here, and here would be the polaritonic field on the nth pillar of our lattice. And what we see is that E, uh, e n is the energy, the on-site energy. You have a gamma here that, that takes into account the losses, the lifetime of the, of the, the photons in our system. It's around 50 picoseconds. We also have a term here that takes into account the nonlinearity, where G is the polaritonic interaction constant. In our lattice, it's usually around 10 micro EV per micro squared per polaritons. And you see that this is a third order nonlinearity. This is like a curve nonlinearity of the third order. Then we have this coupling uh, between the different pillars. And we finally have a term here that takes into account an external drive. Right? And in fact, this, this equation is, is, is simply uh, the equation of uh, harmonic oscillators that are driven dissipative. So they're an external drive, an external force. They're dissipative and they're nonlinear. This is exactly what we, what we have. And the, the, the T and M, in fact, is just coupling between different harmonic oscillators. And we know that, in fact, these systems have a very rich physics. And one of the main example is that now if we have vacuum in our polaritons, um, a polaritonic mode, we have gamma, which is the, 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 the line width associated to the lifetime. We have G, G interaction constant. And now imagine that I'm driving the system, but not in resonance, in slightly blue detune with respect to, to my transition. And one would think that I'm not injecting any polaritons because I'm not in resonance. But because we have a finite lifetime, we can couple to, to the valence and stealth of a Lorentzian uh, profile. And we can in, inject a little bit of polaritons. We can start to populate them all a little bit. But because we have a nonlinearity and because G is positive, this will give rise to a blue shift of the polaritonic mode here. And eventually, if the drive is strong enough, what we can see is that the polaritonic mode will come in resonance with the drive, which will lead to a massive population of 
or mode. And we see here, this is the mean occupation that is plotted as a function of the drive amplitude. We see that at low drive amplitude, we slightly increase and eventually, boom, we have this nonlinear shift when uh, we have this, this condition and we start to increase. And when we lower back the, the, uh, the drive amplitude, we have the same thing, but now with the, with the decay. But now we have the opening of an optical uh, asteresis. We have an optical biostability, which comes from the fact that because we're nonlinear, we can have many solutions. And this is also, a, but all this physics is, you can reproduce it with nonlinear driven dissipative or harmonic oscillator. It's just that here, it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a pendulum that is oscillating, it's, it's, it's a polyatomic field. And so this is what we want to do now. We want to explore this, this machine. Uh, by using our the, the, the drive that will be blue detuned with respect to, with the lower back, and more precisely, we're going to put our, our resonant drive at the center of our topological gap. So it's a really narrow line width laser that is spectrally localized at the center of the energy gap. And in real space, it is also locally, uh, um, uh, spatially localized at the center of the dimer. So we are exciting a single dimer at the center of the energy gap. And what we're going to probe here is the transmission. All right, so this is not a PL measurement, or it's a resonance PL measurement, it's a transmission measurement. All right, and what we're going to see here, on the left, I have two images. The first one is when we scan the power up, and the other one is when we scan the power down. And the color, again, is the light intensity that is transmitted. Horizontal axis is the position against uh, along the lattice and vertical axis is the, the drive power. And we see that at a given threshold, we start to see a very strong emission from one diamond. And eventually, when the power is strong enough, we see the emergence of two other nonlinear domain symmetrically positioned. So what we have here is that we're bringing dimer in the nonlinear regime one by one, clang, clang, clang. These are really discrete jumps. And when we lower back the power, we have the same thing, but not at the same drive power because again we have this, this hysteresis and now if we look at the profile what we're going to see so if we look at the bottom one which is taken in a regime where we only have one dimer in the nonlinear regime we have inside the, the central dimer the pump dimer we have the same intensity of the two pillars but on both sides we have an exponentially decaying curve on the left part it is localized on the a sub lattice and on the right part it is localized on the b sub lattice and the reason why we have this sub lattice polarization is because we are at the center of the gap and we have a linear combination from the lower band, which is symmetric, and the upper band, which is anti symmetric. Right? And, and this sub lattice localization, um, if you think a lot about it, the SSH uh, model, it's really at the core of this symmetry topological protection. And this allows us, in fact, to define a new robustness properties. So, what we're going to do here is to have a defect in our lattice. We're going to add a second laser, which is non resonant, very faint power, just going to create some small carriers. And these small carriers are going to change slightly the index of refraction. And we're going to position it either on the A or the B sub lattice. And by changing the power, it's like changing the energy of this defect. And what you see here is that as we increase, so this is without any defect, no power in, in, in the laser. Now, if we start to increase the power, and we're localized on the B sub lattice, we see that the nonlinear jump occurred earlier. And this is normal because we're starting to perturb the, 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 the lattice where the soliton exists, where its wave function is non vanishing. And the higher this, this effect, the, the stronger the, the energy of the defect, and the more we have an impact. But if we have, so this is 90 microwatt of laser, if we have the same 90 microwatt, but on the other sub lattice, we have no effect at all because at this position, the evanescent, evanescent uh, became felt are vanishing, their amplitude is vanishing also. So this is somehow a robustness property of these polaritons that is completely different of what we used to have in the linear domain because it's intrinsically nonlinear. It's probing at what drive power do we have these, these, these jumps. And so what I would like to say is that we just did numerical simulations of this rough speed AFSC equations that completely uh, validate this, uh, this, 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 these experimental results. And, and one last result I would like to show you is that what we have done here is that rather than, than having a single laser that is resonant with the, with the pump, we have two different lasers that are out of phase. One on an atom of, a dime, uh, of the dimer, 
and one on the second atom. If the two atoms are in phase, it is just the same thing as we did before. We have the same types of solution. But now if we start to, to, to have a phase difference between the two, uh, the two lasers, we're going to create a phase gradient either toward the right or toward the left. And we're going to break the symmetry of these nonlinear solutions. And this is what you see here. You see that as we change the phase difference between the two lasers, the pattern that we're forming, the nonlinear patterns become asymmetric. And eventually it becomes completely localized on one atom, on one pillar of the dimer. And this is like the topological edge test because we're creating a frustration between the pump, between the polyvitone fluid inside our, our structure and the pump that is driving the system. And what is interesting is that these solutions need drive and dissipation. We don't have drive or if we don't have dissipation they are going to completely polyvitons completely evaporate and the solution is not stable but if we had in the first place a symmetric solution we see that even though we don't have drive and dissipation because this is symmetric and this is say, sure, the same symmetry element as the lattice we see that the solution is preserved in time we don't lose our polarity they don't completely vanish so rapidly i'll go to the um, conclusions so I've shown that these, what we call artificial materials, because uh, these are materials where rather than having electronic waves moving in a solid state crystal, we have photonic waves or polaritonic waves moving in, um, in artificially built lattice, allows us to explore this topological physics beyond the possibilities that are allowed by, by solid state crystals. Um, we can allow extracting very uh, fundamental topological properties from the bolt, like I showed with these invariants, and we can also start to explore new types of uh, excitations that rely on optical nonlinearity and that require a non hermeticity to these elements. Uh, and so I would like to, to acknowledge the people with whom I, I did this work. So, Jacqueline uh, Bloch, who, who was the head of the, of the lab, uh, Sylvain Ravet, who joined us in CNRS research uh, quite recently, Alberto Amo, who is now in the University of Lille. Uh, Nicolas Pernet is a PhD student uh, that I supervised for this last work on, on these uh, nonlinear solitons, on the uh, non emission solitons. Of course, people who grew the sample, I listed with the epitaxy, Luc, Isabelle, and Abdou for the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the etching and the lithography, and our collaborators at ICFO, Pietro Massignan, and Alexandre Dauphin, who, who, who designed this technique of, uh, of uh, mean carbon displacement. And so I would like to have just one last slide just to just give a brief overview of what I'm aiming for in the upcoming years. And the, uh, my, my goal is really to explore, extend this topological photonics to the quantum real, where rather than having systems that are described by a mean field approxim approximation, systems are basically classical. We can relate them to the physics of, of the of harmonic oscillators to read. We have a system that is uh, intrinsically quantum and more specific. So they have been really. Um, some really recent example, they're really uh, scarce uh, so far, of generating entangled photon pairs in, in these uh, topologically protected environments, uh, coupling a single quantum dot to a, a topologically protected photonic mode. But my idea is really to explore uh, many body quantum states by, by um, including within the, the topological photonic crystals dense ensemble of, of quantum emitters and to study their dynamics as a group, as an ensemble, uh, their collective excitations and how uh, we can start to stabilize new types of uh, collective excitations thanks to topological uh, detection. All right, so I, I, I don't know how I'm doing with time. It's 11.30, so I, I think I, it's not so bad. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Philip. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I had a question about the nonlinear, non Hermitian, Gross Potayevsky uh, uh, discussion. Are there topological invariants that you can actually define in that situation? 
Well, yeah, okay. So, so that's that's a very good question. That's a it's also a very profound question, and there there are there have been um, uh, theoretical paper that propose um, such new ways, but obviously it's not so so easy because because you you're beyond the regime of a band structure. You, you have drive, you have this nonlinearity, and it, it is really, a, in my opinion, an open question to have really a universal um, description. There has been a lot of work of non-emission topological physics to be to define topological in, in physics in systems that are non-emission, but non-emission and non-linear uh, is still uh, open to discussion. And, and we have been investigating this matters uh, recently, but uh, we don't have like an equivalent of a Berry curvature in, in these systems so far. But it's, it's definitely a very interesting uh, aspect to, to explore. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> So um, the short answer is that no, we're not. We're really bound to two-dimensional, to that two-dimension because because of the way we etch the crystals, and there's not really a way to engineer a, a vertical um, um, periodic arrangement. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it would be extremely difficult to to, to achieve that. But the, where I'm going with with this answer is that there is another way that does not involve building a real three-dimensional lattice. And the idea uh, that, that has been realized in many different systems is that you're going to build a third dimension that is not a, a real dimension, it's a synthetic dimension, is that you allow photons not to move in a real space, but along a synthetic space, like along an energy axis or a momentum axis, another degree of freedom accessible to these, uh, these photons. And as a result, you can move in two dimensional space and along this third uh, dimensional third dimension, which is synthetic and and that in my opinion is is, is the uh, is the most uh promising way to achieve higher dimension and then you're not bound to, to three dimension you can go to four dimension and there has been demonstration of four dimensional quantum hall effect for example but you, you could think of going beyond that Ian has a question Ian, you want to ask a question uh, yes uh... Uh, hi, uh, can you also uh, simulate quantum anomalous hall phases? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, there, 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 there have been. And, and, and always the same difficulty is that um, we need to have a spin orbit interaction that is significant, and we need to have a breaking of time reversal symmetry that is also significant. And right now, we had a problem that, that the, the, the sensitivity to magnetic field is strong but it's not as strong as the line width. So it was difficult to observe this energy gap in the real system. But before I left, I've worked a lot on, on, on really the epitaxy to work with better structures. And we start, now start to see a system with very clear energy gaps. And we could explore the, these, these uh, very interesting regimes um, shortly, yeah. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Don't have any more questions on the chat from the audience. Uh, uh, thank, thanks for a great talk, uh, Kip. Uh, do you hear me online? Right. Uh, so uh, my my question was about dissipation. So so you have quite short uh, right, right. lifetimes. Uh, so the system is actually in close contact with the environment rather yes. than uh, any event or. So, to what extent does it uh, influence and does it uh, impairs the possibilities for implementation of the uh, uh, transmitting like uh, life from plasmonics? Uh, plasmonics uh, so, so yeah. because of lifetime. Yeah. So maybe I can I can just repeat the, the yeah. question for for the benefit. Of, so the question is related to to the lifetime of the polaritons. How how, how can it impair? The, the possibility that could be done, like it did for plasma, it's at some, at some extent. And, and, and the idea is, again, that yes, dissipation can be um, detrimental because, and I would say that mainly uh, it, it, what is going to happen is that it's going to broaden your line width in such a way that you don't see your topological gaps. This is the main problem that we often have. Um, the technique that we have, we have, uh, I would say, the best line width 
because of the etching technique, because of everything. And this allows us to see this, this physics, but it's still a problem that we have this, uh, this lifetime. And, and we need to work on the passivation of the surfaces. We need to work on the better etching, especially in two dimensions. Like you see, the lifetime is critical. It, it, it's a problem. But our goal is also to use dissipation. So do not have com, com, a very, very long lifetime in such a way that you have a conservative system because then you start to lose in other aspects of physics. So it is also always a compromise, enhancing uh, the lifetime in order to have very nice band structure, but not too much or not for all the time when you want to explore uh, new types of physics. So for example, when you want to build a laser, you want to have a rather short lifetime because you want to have a very strong efficiency in this kind of thing. So, so we're, this, this is the, the way we're playing. And I would say that, that the line with this, uh, the, the lifetime is right now the main limitations for reaching the quantum regime because the lifetime is much larger. It's an order of magnitude larger than the polariton polariton interaction. So you cannot reach some kind of blockade regime like you do, like electron Coulomb blockade. Uh, that's the next step, uh, uh, next big step in terms of enhancing the lifetime. Okay, so we don't have any more questions. So join me to uh, thanks Philip for his uh, nice presentation. Thank you.